they're, they're very, very sad, but because Iraq was a very harmonious state, even under Saddam Hussein. And they've done the same thing in Syria. They're breaking that up with, with a vigor. They intend to break up Saudi Arabia. And of course, Libya is no longer anything like it used to be. Libya has also been broken into two or three pieces. This is called the Yinon Plan. The Israeli plan is called, written by Oded Yinon, and that's why they call it the Yinon Plan. And we're fortunate that there was an Israeli man named Israel Shahak who translated this document into English for us. Otherwise, we wouldn't know about it because the Israelis use Hebrew as like a, a code language that nobody can understand. But Israel Shahak was a, 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 human, a humanitarian, and he thought the world should know what Israel's master plan is to dominate the Middle East. This just gives you an idea of the ethnic consti constituent parts of Iraq. For example, the north is Kurdistan, Kurdish area. The, the, ye the yellow area is basically the Sunni area. And the green area of Iraq is the Shiite area. I want to point out that the Kurdish area in the north of Iraq and Syria, the, um, the largest oil company there is owned by the Rothschild family. And likewise, in the Golan Heights, which has occupied Syria, again, the Rothschilds own the oil company there in conjunction with Mr. Murdoch and Dick Cheney. This map shows you what children see in textbooks. This is the, this is the, image, this is the map of the Middle East as it was constructed, after, as it was after World War II. And this gives you an idea of how they intend to fracture the area into many statelets. You can see here that they intend to break off the Arab part of Iran near Basra and make an Arab Shiite state there. And that's where all the oil of Iran is. The oil of Iran is in, the, in that area near Basra. As I said, terrorism has spiked. As a result of the war on terrorism, terrorism has gone only up. And terrorism is now 10 times more common in Syria, in Iraq, in, in, in Afghanistan than it was prior to 9-11. So we spent a lot of money, invested a lot, spent a lot of lives, killed a lot of people, but terrorism is worse now than it ever was. And that's come at a great cost. The U.S. defense budget has basically doubled, the green bar being $300 billion, what we were paying for defense prior to 9-11, and now we're paying closer to $800 billion a year. So it's, it's taking a couple thousand dollars a year out of every, every pocket, every, every American per year. Children, doesn't matter, women, everybody. $2,000 a year per person to defend a country that has an ocean on both sides and friendly neighbors north and south. We're spending this kind of money. So as I said about the Likud, the Likud was created in 1973 and was created by the former terrorists of the, of the, of the, of the Zionist groups in the 1930s and 40s. The founder of the Likud was the founder of the, was the former chief of the Irgun, the man in the middle, his name is Menachem Begin. The man on the right, that's Yitzhak Shamir. He was the head of the Stern Gang, or Lehi. And the, the heavyset fellow, that's Ariel, Shamir, Ariel Sharon. And that was basically their protege, their, the, the guy they were bringing along. And of course, Ariel Sharon was the one that invaded Lebanon in 1982 and committed the massacres in Sabra and Shatila camp, um, for which he was held personally accountable in a court of law in Israel and re removed from power. And, they, and it, when the Kahana Commission had their result finding, they said he was personally responsible for the massacres in Sabra and Shatila. He should lose his, his portfolio of defense, and he should never hold position in an Israeli government again, what 10 years later became prime minister. Um, this is the, the, the emblem of the Irgun party, which was headed by Mr. Begin. What I want to show you here is that the, the concept of Eretz Israel is central to this organization. This is the Irgun, this is the group that became the Likud. So the Likud has this idea that Israel should increase its size and become, take up the land of Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. And they have this gun there and it says in Hebrew, Rakach, which means only thus, only with the gun will we achieve this territorial ambition that we have. And Mr. Netanyahu, his father was the head of the new Zionist organization, which is the ideological father of the Irgun. Jabotinsky was the former head of it. When he died in 1940, Mr. Netanyahu's father became the head of that. It's important to understand it because you have to understand where this extreme element comes from and what it means. Because Mr. Netanyahu gets up there and tells lies and seems really suave, speaks English very well. He's a lying, pathological monster, really. Uh, this is uh, another one of those guys. This is Menachem Begin, 1948, born in Russia, came to Palestine in 42, um, joined the Irgun, became the leader, 
and then promptly bombed the King David Hotel in 1946. In 1973, he created the Likud Coalition with his former terrorist buddies, he became prime minister in 77. That was the end for Israel as a secular labor state. When these guys took power in 1977, Israel changed fundamentally. The Labor Party was pushed aside, and these fanatic terrorists became the power of Israel. Unfortunately, Zionist history is not taught in this country, so although we have a Congress that jumps up and down and applauds these people, most American people do not have any understanding what Zionism really means. Um, in 1977, he became Prime Minister. In 78, he invaded Lebanon. And in 1982, he went into Lebanon with a ground invasion in which something like 20,000 Lebanese people and Palestinian people were killed. This is what he did in 1946 when they bombed the King David Hotel. It's a, 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 an atrocity very similar to 9-11. 93, 93 people were killed, and at the time, the King David Hotel was the headquarters of British, the British operations in Palestine. This is during the British Mandate period when Britain, after World War I, was the mandate power in Palestine. Well, in 1974, a, a British journalist asked Mr. Begin, he said, how does it feel in light of what's going on to be the father of terrorism in the Middle East? And Begin said, in the Middle East, in all the world. So he was very proud of putting the mantle on himself of being the father of terrorism in the world. This is not somebody else talking about him. This is what he says about himself. And he's not, he's not lying. Here's a picture of him when he was wanted by the British police. And there on the bottom row, second one in is Shamir. Third one in is, is uh, Nathan Yellen Moore. I point out Nathan Yellen Moore with the glasses there because he is a, re a relative of Gilad Atzmon, for example. Gilad Atzmon told me when I saw him in Portland a couple, about a year ago that he's related to this man, Yellen Moore. He was also related to Janet Yellen, who is the Secretary of, of you know, Federal Reserve, Chairman of the Federal Reserve. He's related to uh, Zippy Livni, former Prime, uh, Foreign Minister of Israel. And he was related to Menachem Atzmon, the CEO of ICTS, which was the key defendant in the 9-11 tort litigation. This is the company that, that owned and ran airport security on 9-11 at our airports. And I said, I told Gilad Atzman, I said, now I understand why you do what you're doing. And he says, yeah, it's a lot of guilt, huh? Here we have uh, Yitzhak Shamir, and he was involved in the murder of Folke Bernadotte. Folke Bernadotte was the Swedish count, the, king, the king's uncle who went to Palestine for the United Nations to try and make a, a way to solve the Palestinian partition plan of 1947, in which the United Nations, in its, all of its wisdom, took Palestine and cut it into pieces and gave some pieces to the Arabs and some pieces to the, or the Palestinians and some pieces to the Jews. But what they did is it was a massive land theft. They were taking the land of the Palestinian Arabs and the Palestinians and giving it to the Jews, who were immigrants from Russia and it didn't belong to them. Well, this caused a problem, and, and Folke Bernadotte wanted to maintain this uh, independent status for the city of Jerusalem. The Zionists wouldn't have any of it, so they massacred him in a style like Bonnie and Clyde. And this man, Yitzhak Shamir, was in charge of the organization that killed the Count. What's important to understand about that is that this man, Rami Manuel's father, was part of that gang. He was a member of the Stern gang. He told me, I talked to him personally, and uh, he said he was a member of Lehi, Stern gang. And, and his son then became, later, the chief advisor to Bill Clinton and was the first chief of staff for um, Barack Obama. And this guy is now the mayor of my city, hometown Chicago. Uh, he was described by the, sh the well-known Sherman Skolnick, who was a very good observer of Chicago politics, as being the Mossad agent in the White House during Clinton and... See, this is important to understand how the advisors play a key role. The president has to make a lot of, it, a lot of appointments every week. The president has no clue who to appoint. But, but the advisors are there to funnel to him the names of the people that they have chosen to be appointed. Well, Isser Harel, this man here, was the first, found, the first chief of the Mossad and the first chief of the Shin Bet, these Israeli intelligence operations, foreign and, and, and domestic. And in 1980, he was meeting with a, an American Zionist named Michael Evans, who is a Jewish fellow who has like a Christian Zionist prayer Jerusalem team, Jerusalem prayer club, something like that, who is a Christian Zionist, basically. And this Mr. Michael Evans from Texas seems to have entree 
into the home of, you know, um, Menachem Begin and, and this Isser Harel, who was the head of the Mossad. And he, he had a dinner with this guy in 1980, and he said, do you think terrorism will come to America? And if so, where and why? And Isser Harel said, yes, I think it will come to you in America. America has the power, but not the will, etc. As to the where, Harel continued, this is in 1980, he said, New York City is the symbol of freedom and capitalism. It's likely they will strike your tallest building and a symbol of your power. The, the, he called the Empire State Building. Um, this is 21 years before 9-11, and the head of the Mossad has this uncanny prediction that Arabs are going to bomb the World Trade Center or the Empire State Building. Well, was he dreaming? A couple years later, a couple of his chief lieutenants, these men here, went to New York with the intention of getting the security contract for the World Trade Center, and they got it. The top guy is Zvi Malkin. The guy on the bottom is Avraham Shalom Bendor. And they came at, you know, young age of like 50 years old, came to America, and they were on this mission. These men had previously worked with Isar Harel very closely on the kidnapping of, of Adolf Eichmann in Argentina. Took him to Israel and hanged him, tried him and hanged him. They were involved in shipping an illegal shipment of plutonium from this country to Israel for the nuclear weapons program. So these were very high-level Mossadniks. And in 1987, they tried to get the security contract for the World Trade Center for an Israeli company called Atwell Security of Tel Aviv. Atwell Security of Tel Aviv was owned by Shaul Eisenberg, which is a name you, you, you might want to keep putting in your file there. He was Mr. China. This is Shaul Eisenberg was the main Mossad man in China and Japan. During World War II, he had been an advisor to the Imperial Government of Japan. And, and what the Imperial Government of Japan did was trained the Likud militia, called Beitar, in terrorism. Then they, these people went from Japan, these Jews from R Russia and stuff, went from Japan, where they were trained, to Palestine, where they practiced all those arts of terrorism they had learned from the Japanese in the War of 1947-48. Well, what happened was in, 19, in 1987, these guys got the security contract for the World Trade Center, and only because somebody at the Port Authority discovered that the man who was the president of the company, this man on the bottom, was using a fake name, and that he was wanted, that he was a, he was convicted murderer in Israel. Then they said, "Oh no, we can't give the security contract to this guy. He, he's he's a murderer." It was it, what he had done. The man on the bottom, also known as Shalom Bendor, he had been the head of the Shin Bet. And in 1984, there was a bus hijacking. Some Palestinians hijacked a bus. When the bus was cleared and they, they, had the, they had the Palestinian guys in the bus, he said, well, just save some time. Just smash their heads with rocks. So that's what they did. They smashed these Palestinian heads with rocks. And they both were killed. And, but in Israel, they have a judiciary. And the judici judiciary held him accountable for this. And they said, you're guilty of murder. You cannot give such an illegal order to kill people like that. Well, he, he, he went to America then, new career, career change, and the Americans discovered, hey, this guy has got a record of murder. He cannot be in charge of the security for the Port Authority, the tunnels, the bridges, the, and the World Trade Center. So they tore up the contract. Key event. Had that contract not been torn up in 1987, 9-11 would have probably happened in 1989 or 1990 at the latest, which would have put us at a great disadvantage because we had no internet then. And we would have just simply been given the narrative from Time Magazine, the New York Times, and we would have said, okay, that's the way it is. Like in 1972 when they told us about the Munich Massacre. The facts be, be known, most likely the Munich Massacre was also false flag terrorism. But that's only, we can only understand that looking back in retrospect and looking at the people involved. But the, the, the equalizer in this current condition we're in now, what gives us at least a fighting chance is that we have the internet. So when those two Mossad guys were rebuffed by the Port Authority, they didn't give up and go home. They simply used what we call Sayanim. These two men are American Jews who are very warm to Israel, very fond of Israel, big supporters of Israel, and big criminals. And what they did is that Jules Kroll at the top and Maurice Greenberg, Hank Greenberg, Maurice, these two men are business partners. And what, this, what the Shalom Bandor did, he went to work for this man, Jules Kroll. And then in 1993, when the bombing of the World Trade Center happened in the garage, Kroll Associates got the security contract for the World Trade Center. 